Welcome to Booked, where two guys talk about the books they're reading. I'm Rob Olson. And I'm Livia Snedden. Rob, I know this isn't a surprise to anybody that listened last week, right? But we talk about the books we're reading. How many books exactly will we have talked about after tonight? 250, my man. This is a milestone. This is a big Holy one. Holy shit. 250 books. Um, that is a lot. Now, what do you know offhand what episode number that is? Oh, 442 is what we're on right now. Yeah, that's the disturbing part, is that <laughs> I always thought, so when we first started this, I thought we are just going to read a book every week. And I said, all right, that's not fucking sustainable. We're going to need a little bit of a break. So three out of four weeks, we're going to do a book, right? So three books, then an interlude or an interview or, or whatever it is that uh, that we decide to, to do. But by my math, and I'm not like using a calculator or a pen or anything, should be up over 300 right like 313 yeah that tracks yeah so uh despite the fact that we're a little bit behind where i think we should be holy shit dude 250 books we've reviewed yeah that's uh it's pretty great and um it, it was fitting that we chose the book that we did considering like we were talking about in the previous episode this is probably uh, one of the first books that was significant to our friendship when we first uh, started hanging out and stuff. Indeed. Now, we were not able to figure out um, the very first book because that would have been really, really good. But mm. certainly the most memorable of the early books is what yeah. we're covering tonight, and yeah. that is Apathy and Other Small Victories by Paul Nealon. I call it the first best definitely the first best i was thinking about that and you know i i feel like maybe arturo perez reverte could oh, have yeah. possibly been and i don't remember would have been like um oh club dumas to, probably yeah probably the club dumas any rate f that guy we're gonna talk about paul neela now <laughs> i um i'm taking issue with the bio i don't think his bio has been updated because i feel like this is the same bio that's been on there for the 10 or so years that this book has been out. Um, and I mentioned that because it's right in the first line. Paul Nealon recently left his mind numbing job at an insurance company in Portland, Oregon, where he spent most of his time hiding in the bathroom and weeping born of this and many, many other humiliations. Apathy and other small victories is his first novel. Yeah. I, it reads pretty old. Yeah, yeah, I think that this might be um, from when it came out. Um, we should address quickly for people who don't know this. Uh, I think I speak for us both when I say Apathy is um, the funniest book, or at least one of the funniest books that either one of us has ever read. It is certainly one of my favorite books of all time. I think I speak for Rob when I say that, too. Um, sadly, this is the only book to date that Paul Nealon has put out. Um, we did reach out to him years ago once we once we figured out that we had the um that's what i'm looking for like the status that we could reach out to this legendary um writer at least for both of us um he did write back a very nice email declining to do an interview until he had something that he could talk about um and uh so far i looked again this past week i didn't see anything noteworthy coming up from paul nealon which makes me sad inside to be really honest yeah. Um, the funny thing is, uh, I don't remember exactly where I was. I did some like random Googling just to kind of, you know, get some information. And if you search for him or the title of his book, um, there's so many articles saying there's like two main themes that kind of bubbled to the surface. And one of them was uh, whatever happened to Paul Nealon, um, because everybody's kind of eager to, to see what another book from him looks like. And the other thing was exactly what you said like that this was the funniest book I've ever read and not just from random people, but from celebrities and authors and stuff like that. So um, while this book came out in 2007 and I actually think the actually we, we said 2007, I think that's the paperback. I think the actual hardcover came out in 2006, but that's kind of splitting hairs. Um, yeah. 2006. Uh, it has, Oh, I was on uh, the Reddit books subreddit maybe mm -hmm. somewhere but like the it just like there was just topic after topic of whatever happened to this guy i'd love to see more stuff from him and his book is so funny and stuff like that so it has endured over time as as you know and probably grown in its uh notoriety 
over the years is just being, um, and, and the funny thing is, and I'm getting probably ahead of myself. I didn't really remember what was so charming about it, but reading it again, we'll talk about it. I was like, Oh yeah, everybody's right. Well, all the people that loved it are right. There are some naysayers. We might get to that too. We'll see. Stupid people. All right. Let's tell folks what this one's about. All right. Livius gives me the heavy lifting this time. Here's a synopsis pulled from Amazon, a scathingly funny debut novel about disillusionment, indifference, and one man's desperate fight to assign absolutely no meaning to modern life. The only thing Shane cares about is leaving, usually on a Greyhound bus right before his life falls apart again, just like he planned. But this time it's complicated. There's a sadistic corporate climber who thinks she's his girlfriend, a rent-subsidized affair with his landlord's wife, and the bizarrely appealing deaf assistant to Shane's cosmically unstable dentist. When one of the women is murdered and Shane is the only suspect who doesn't care enough to act like he didn't do it, the question becomes just how he'll clear the good name he never had and doesn't particularly want his own. Uh, And then here's a quote from The Village Voice, and I'm including it because uh, that kind of dates it a little bit because The Village Voice stopped publishing like two years ago. Uh, The malaise of cubicle culture may be well-trodden comedy comedic territory by now, but Neelan's debut skewers office life with a flourish for the grotesque. I, um, I don't know. Um, the village voice commentary. Like, I don't know. I mean, I guess a lot of it does take place at work. Like I, someone else, it's, I was reading some reviews and, um, they were saying, you know, comparing it to office space and stuff. And I didn't feel like the bulk of this book. Like, I, I don't think that it's an office book. It's not, it's not a commentary on corporate culture. If that's, if as, which is kind of what that quote implies. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But it does take a stab at corporate culture. I just don't think that's the focus of the book. Right. Yeah. Um, this book, um, isn't exactly linear. So I think we'll kind of give you the, the groundwork for it, but basically we're introduced to Shane. Shane is new in town. Um, and he's uh, trying to make his way in town. He immediately meets Gwen, um, who he hooks up with. And she um, she's uh, she's very aggressive and very self-absorbed. And basically everything um, in her life, including her relationship with Shane, is is about her and how she can better him and what type of reflection he has on her. So at any rate, she eventually gets him a job at the insurance company that she works at, where Shane continues to be, um, you know, uh, apathetic for lack of a better term. So he doesn't give a shit about anything, um, which is uh, pretty cool in this book in the standpoint of exactly how many things he doesn't care about. Cause it's really impressive. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. At times because of this, you know, as it's mentioned in the synopsis, because of the fact that, that uh, he's a suspect, like he cares about not going to jail, <laughs> but really it's probably the only thing in this whole book he, he cares about. Yeah, so um, early on, it's just established how much um, he has opinions on things, but all of those opinions pretty much lead to, like, no faith in anything, um, not caring about things, and, and things like that. So um, early on also, the level of humor in the book is established from probably, like, the first you know, a few pages uh, and especially with the introduction of uh, some other main kind of a uh, main plot line in the book is um, his dentist and his dentist assistant. So he's at his dentist and um, the, the probably like the least entertaining setting I could, you know, one of the least entertaining settings you could think of is the dentist's office, except for like humorous observations or whatever, but they're not normal people. So his dentist, Dr. Doug Weinhardt um, is this uh, he has I I guess the best way I could say is like almost panic attacks or weird anxiety Mm -hmm. because there is a recurring situation with him on public transportation where bus doors close on his head and it's just caused all these problems in his life so he's got this dentist who freaks out and has to drink tea to calm down Um, but he's also the dentist assistant um, who becomes a, a bigger part of the, of the story too, um, Marlene, is deaf. And so in visiting 
the dentist, he has to deal with his really kind of weirdo dentist while he's talking to his assistant who's deaf and he's picking up sign language just because he's he's gone through enough visits where like it, it all just starts to they become familiar and and he's learning sign language and like signing these awful things to her and it's just an absurd situation that he's put into and it seems like they are the people that he likes the most in his life um even though it's just completely absurd the entire situation yeah darlene's the closest thing that he has to a friend in this book um because really uh, i'm sorry marlene marlene what did i say did i say darlene you did oh marlene marlene who's <laughs> deaf so we'll call her darlene for simplicity's sake because they're calling her <laughs> deaf marlene um is the closest thing he has to a friend in this book. And, and, you know, I said, like, he doesn't care about anything. I, I, ultimately, I feel like he cares about her. Yeah. And there's maybe another character that he cares a little bit about, which is interesting. And I, I don't think we're going to do spoiler talk for this. I mean, the book, I want everybody that's listening to read this book. So I'm going to try not to yeah. go full bore and spoil it. That being said, we might talk a little bit deeper about it because it's not... It's one of those books that's not really plot driven. There is a plot and we're essentially really we're introduced to, to the situation by, um, you know, detectives showing up at his place because somebody has died to question him. And that's why I said it's a little nonlinear and that we start there and then we go back and we look at things that happen, you know, leading up to the time that, you know, the detectives are pick him up for questioning. Um, but, yeah, his relationship with Marlene is absolutely adorable. Yeah. Like I, I, it's so endearing because they are, they're kind of nasty to one another, but it's, it's really like this. It feels like their relationship transcends the stupid, dumb things they say to one another, mm -hmm. um, that they have kind of a kinship, which is, uh, you know, again, this, this whole book is, like I said, it's not necessarily plot driven, um, but it's really his relationships with people and this is likely, and Rob may disagree a little bit, but it's the only positive one in the book is his relationship with Marley. <laughs> like every other really, he has relationships. They're just all very negative. And it honestly, like, cause I've thought of, you know, I, I, I think about what does it mean and stuff like that. It kind of belies like probably a, like a deeper part of his character. The fact that like, cause I was just putting myself in his shoes. If I had a crazy dentist and his assistant was deaf, most people would just limit their interaction with the assistant as much as possible because most, most people get a new fucking dentist. Yeah. Because they just don't want to have to deal with a person who communicates differently. And this guy, it doesn't even phase him that she's deaf. He just dives right into interacting with her to the point where he's learning her language. And, and so like most people wouldn't go that far. And, and as much as this guy doesn't care, um, I feel like his not giving a shit, kind of bleeds into a positive way sometimes too, because he doesn't give a shit about um, trying to just make his life easier. He's just going to talk to this person because she's around. For sure. He does get a job at a insurance company where he is supposed to sort and collate and essentially just alphabetize things. So that's essentially how he refers to his job for, uh, for the, the length of the book. And he has decided that this job is beneath him. And the, the part where it talks about, you know, skewering office life and, and whatever is that he spends his most of his days in the bathroom sleeping like in the stall on a toilet, <laughs> um, which is great because that's the, um, the the cover is the 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 male symbol that's on um, the front of like a, a restroom door, yep. but holding a gun to its head, um, which is, you know, a, a, a ton of fun. Um, but yeah, it's essentially his work life goes between sleeping in the restroom and then looking at all the ridiculous and mundane things that happen in the office around him. So how people react to things. Um, he spends a lot of time talking about inspiration, um, insp inspiration, like hall alley. I so think. it was called alley. Yeah. Um, you know, which from which he draws several, uh, of those inspirational quotes that you see at places. And all of it is very pointed and very accurate from situations I've been in that were like that. Yep. And so while we're kind of just experiencing his life as it on, you know, as it like his day to day life, there's like kind of a murder investigation going on because like Livia said, somebody died. 
And so uh, there's interactions with police and then um, to some degree he becomes invested in figuring out what's going on too, partially like self-preservation, um, but also maybe there's some tugs of like that caring that we talked about a little bit. Um, so the story's trajectory is, is um, it's kind of a snapshot of his life from when he rolls into this town um, through the weird um, like investigation of this, this woman's death. And honestly, like, like Livius was saying, it's not super plot driven. I would say that um, the plot, while it, it doesn't seem super important is, is well structured and makes sense and is good, but it's line by line. Like you could flip to any page and look at any paragraph and that's going to be super entertaining. Um, I did some rough math. I think I have 29 highlights. <laughs> it just, just funny stuff that I thought I might want to talk about. Yeah. And, and, and obviously I'm not going to do it. Cause it'd be me, be me reading half the book, but I'm pretty sure that's the most I've ever highlighted in any book ever. So when we talk about the writing, um, obviously I don't know that the humor is for absolutely everybody or whatnot, but I mean, this guy, I don't know what he's doing right now, mm -hmm. but I can say based on reading this book that I don't feel that he's doing what he was meant to do. Cause if it's not <laughs> making people laugh, then he's doing the wrong thing. Yeah. It's one of those books that um, it's, it, it, you're, you're reading the essence of this protagonist down to like the, the minute, the most minute detail. And I've got at least two examples that I will give. Uh, I'll give one right now, just to kind of give the idea. And it's so relatable. It's like, it's negative and it's um a little bit, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's like whatever the opposite of optimistic is pessimistic, but it's so relatable because you're reading this stuff and you're like, I can totally see myself doing or thinking the exact same thing. So here's an example. Um, <laughs> We didn't mention the salt shakers yet, but salt shakers have a, a significance to the book. And at one point, one breaks in the dentist's office, and um, he feels bad about it, and he's he he wants to clean it up. So th this little two sentence thing is great. There's there was a broom, but no dustpan, so the best I could do was sweep the salt up against the walls, which was as much as I would have done anyway. Yep. And I was like, "That's totally me. That's where I would have stopped." <laughs> yeah. It is, uh, the salt shakers are hilarious because there's never any like good, I mean, I'm going to say it because it really starts off at the beginning of the book because he wakes up in his bed and there's salt in the bed. <clears throat> he just steals salt shakers from places. There's no real explanation ever given as to why. It's just something that starts happening to him, uh, you know, that, that he feels this need to do it. And it comes up, I don't mm -hmm. know, 15, 16 times in the book. And it's no less funny than it is the first time. Yeah, it's just, yeah. and he does that so well. Like he'll introduce things that have nothing to do with the plot, but they're still like you never think, oh well, that's useless. Why is that there? It's always funny. There's this whole like at toward the end of the book, there's this like three page thing about how much he hates his bicycle, and it has nothing to do with the story, but it's one of my favorite parts of the book because it's just so stupidly entertaining. Yeah, that bicycle, um, from a plot standpoint, he, he buys a, a bicycle from a thrift store. And, and he kind of details the problems with the bicycle in, in a couple different parts. And it just gets worse and worse throughout the course of the book. So there is an actual chase scene, if that's the right <laughs> thing, where it all comes to a culmination, which is, like Rob said, it's like two or three pages. And it's literally some of the funniest shit that I've ever read in my life. Yeah. Um. I guess there's a couple other characters that, um, so we've talked a little bit about the dentist office kind of group of people. We talked a little bit about work, um, at work, uh, the, you know, besides his, uh, possible girlfriend, um, a notable character. He's got a boss named Andrew. Who's just like the typical, like you would picture him as the office space boss kind of guy. Yeah. Um, and then there's a guy named Carl, um, who, <laughs> is just described as this really weird guy who 
uh, kind of does pl- upkeep of the plants in the office, but he's really bad at it. Um, and then there's the other kind of group that uh, that exists in this book is is the people in and around his apartment building. Yep. Um, so his landlord's name is Bryce. Bryce has a wife who plays a part in this story. Um, it's even mentioned in the the synopsis: a rent subsidized affair with the landlord's wife. Uh, <laughs> Do you notice that <laughs> she never gets a name? She doesn't get a name. I searched through the book because I wanted. Which is to... awesome. Yeah, <laughs> she's just the wife. Uh, she seems to me. It's the funny thing is, and I hope this isn't spoiling anything. She seems to me to be the most like Shane of all the characters. That's... Like she's like the woman Shane. Yeah, that's what I was gonna, when I said he might have affection for yeah. somebody else. It's her, <laughs> and it's because she probably cares even less about the things around her than he does. <laughs> Kindred spirit. Yep. Uh, also in the building is. Uh, a guy that goes by Mobo, although he has a normal name, um, who kind of, he lives upstairs from Shane and kind of is a drug dealer. But the the standout thing about him is besides the fact that he dresses really weird looking with like a leather trench coat or something like that. He has a guinea pig that he dresses up in bondage gear named Ivan. Ivan, the guinea, the bondage guinea pig. Yes, absolutely. Um, (laughs) Other than that, I mean, there's some people at a, bar so he has like these different areas <laughs> of his life and shane is super consistent through all of it which like i said is an amazing feat uh, to see him care so little about just everything yeah yeah i do have a couple of quotes um i mean 29 of them <laughs> if i'm counting uh but that uh, i wanted to mention um, just to give you an idea. So Rob had said like the minute little details. So some of it's really funny. Some of it's like physical comedy. So he has like interactions with Gwen where they're uh, where they're having sex. And it's completely blown out of proportion where he's sure he's broken a bone every time or something like that. So you get that almost Jack Tripper style, um, you know, physical comedy. There's the whole bike thing. But then there are like the little throwaway lines that are just wonderful. So. Without getting into the whole story, he's responsible for something. And the quote is, is all written from first person. It says, I could blame myself for how it turned out, but I've never been comfortable with that sort of thing. <laughs> like that line, you could almost read past it and not get it. Yep. But there are so many of them in this book that just make it, like I said, a fun read. Shane is someone like you want to hang out with, but you don't want to have to depend on him for anything. Yeah. I want to. I'm going to do a, a really long quote, um, just because uh, it's fucking. It's insane, but it's just like a direct window into how this character thinks, and it makes me think that Paul Nealon probably is very much this way. This is describing how this guy thinks, like a metaphor he thinks of for uh, having sex with someone. It's the tuna, Livius. Um. Our canned tuna sex was transcendent. The edges were still jagged and razor sharp where we'd been pried open, but inside it was wet and salty, tender, and softly breaking to pieces. We used the whole bed and went slow. We held on to each other close and and closed our eyes. We were one fish moving in rhythm through cool water. It was good. No matter who you are or what you try to tell yourself, everyone has to eat sometimes. For sure. For sure. That's, um... (laughs) And that was like the sweetest thing was him thinking about that. Like that was him being romantic about like thinking romantically about this significant sex moment. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, Without doing a really long quote, um, Marlene is also married to a a gentleman who's deaf um, and they met at a disco. So this is kind of Shane talking about, um, you know, what he thought about what a deaf disco would be and then her telling him so you know it goes on like you know she says that she told me it was a club where they pump up the music you're bleedingly loud and have <laughs> sets of strobe lights and fog that smells like raspberries everyone turns it right so on and on and on at the end of this description he says i imagined it looked like the piano breakdown of a charlie brown special Ah, <laughs> uh, everything oh magic so good. magic so good um 
I'm going to, I'm going to throw out, we usually don't do quotes. This is great, but we haven't done quotes in a really long time. That's the thing about this book is like, you have to understand that like, it's the writing it's, it's the way that he writes things is, is what makes it so entertaining. So at one point he's at the police station because we know he's suspected of killing someone and um, the detectives uh, approach him and, and, and ask for a sample. And this is the interaction that goes on. Um, I can't jerk off into a plastic bag. I said, it's Easter. I was feeling punchy and ridiculous and afraid. I was already working on my insanity defense. You can, and you will, or we'll have the Easter bunny come in and do it for you. Sykes says, what the hell is wrong with you two? It's not Easter. Brooks was disgusted with both with us both again. <laughs> yep. Do you remember? God, I, you'll remember because you actually have a working memory. Do you remember that knockoff book of this that we read? This just came yeah. to me. Like it had the very similar cover. Someone had reached out and said, hey, I think you guys would like this. And yeah. it was no app. What was that called? It was called Murder and Other Distractions. And the author's name is Michael Estrin. Yeah, I remember we talked at length about the similarities then, like the cover and even like the naming theme. Oh, yeah. Like apathy and other small victories, murder and other distractions. Uh, Sorry, I don't know why that came up while I was looking at my quotes, but I'd forgotten about it until just now. It Even the cover of that book even has the guy Mm -hmm. with the the gun to his head. Yep. Yep. Um, Yeah. and, And we read that because he contacted us. Correct. And asked yep. us to, to review it. Here's a, here's so, another quote. Sorry, I took us out of that. I just, it, it struck me like a, like a, a, what do they call that? Like when you had something terrible happen to you, but then all of a sudden it comes back to you. Oh, out of like nowhere. you had a That's repressed that memory that like came out. That's of it. And... Yes. Yep. And I began to develop a kind of bathroom narcolepsy so that whenever I sat on a toilet, I'd start nodding off even if I wasn't tired. Oh, so good. <laughs> So good. <laughs> Can I? All right. So I'm going to break in on that one because I had something similar happen. So the context of that is like, uh, like Livius explained before, he would go into the bathroom and fall asleep. Um, and, and he basically Pavloved himself into any time he was sitting on a toilet, he got sleepy. Uh, when I was younger, uh, I used to need some sort of sound to fall asleep. But I discovered that uh, if I was listening to music, there was too many ups and downs. Like it would get too loud and it would wake me up. And so I decided to start listening to just comedy, like albums, basically. Mm-hmm. And um, my comedy albums of choice were, were George Carlin, because I just had a bunch of them. So I would just throw on something, and just hearing that kind of droning of, of a voice was enough to put me to sleep. Um, and that was for years what I did. When I went to sleep, I would just throw on a comedy album, fall asleep. I was, <laughs> I was hanging out with my friend Jerry at his house one day and um he's like, Oh, there's a there's a new Carlin uh you know, HBO special or whatever. So we sit down, we're just watching it, we're just hanging out, watching it on TV, and I just like th- for three minutes into the show, I just start like nodding off. And I it's cause I had programmed myself to basically fall asleep to George Carlin's voice. That's kind of funny and dangerous. Like if you're listening like satellite radio, <laughs> yeah, the car. Carlin bit comes on, you just drive off the side of the road. Yeah. I wonder if you could sue somebody for that. I mean, Carlin's yeah. dead, but maybe like Sirius XM or something. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Shane is invited to a party at Marlene's house for her birthday and he gets there. And of course, almost everybody there is deaf. So uh, she says, you know, she, says to him signs to him you know hey come with me i want to show you something and this is the the quote here when she led me into her bedroom i got a little nervous because it was packed with people i just wasn't sure i could handle a deaf gangbang all the howls and moaning like a bag of kittens drowning in a river (laughs) yeah this is a good time for this how so this book is 12 13 years old best estimation right so he wrote it 14, 13, 15 yeah. years ago. Yep. Yeah. I wonder how well this book would go over today. I mean, it would encounter some obstacles. Yeah. So the <laughs> word retarded is used at least 20 or 30 times. Yep. Basically, every time he talks about his bicycle, right, it comes up. <laughs> there is a lot, a lot of 
uh, I, I don't know if making fun of the deaf is the right way to say it because I didn't feel like that's how it was, but I feel like that's how it would be interpreted. I'm not sure this book survives today's kind of culture the way it did in 2006. Um, yeah, I, I, I yeah, you have a point because at least not in its current incarnation, like there would be compromises. Um, I think that the word retarded has just been completely thrown out by now. Right. Um, so that's a problem. Uh, and then, yeah, the, the sensitivity around like deaf, you know, deaf people, but in the context of the book, like if you take quotes out of context, it seems mean, but in the context of the book, this guy is just thinking about stuff and he doesn't have any ill will toward anybody. Well, I mean, he has ill will toward everybody kind of on a general level, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but he's like, not, he's not, he's not picking he's not one a, group. Yeah, <laughs> he's not a deaf hater. Like, and, and no. it's demonstrated by the fact that he learned sign language and one of the people he cares most about is deaf, but he says some stuff that would be offensive to deaf people. So yeah, I think it would, it would face some real, real struggles. While we're still on the making fun of deaf people, um, this is a little bit of a longer one. Hi, dick nose. She signed back. Hi, shit face. Hi, cocksucker. Hi, ass head. I always ran out of real curses before she did. Then we both smile, overly sarcastic, and squint our eyes and bow to each other repeatedly while performing elaborate gibberish hand gestures <laughs> to say that we were sorry. It was like kabuki theater. Then she'd laugh because she was only kidding, and I'd laugh too because at least I could fucking hear. <laughs> Yeah. See, and that's the thing, like, uh, I don't know. Um, I feel like in a real situation where, like, you are close with someone who's deaf, those types of thoughts naturally occur, whether it's by you or by the person who is deaf. Like, that kind of casual, you know, no fucks kind of thing is natural. Like, I guess, like, the closest thing I can say is, like, situations like that would occur with uh, Adam and Oshkosh, whose legs don't work. Mm -hmm. Um, Where, like, I would seemingly be very insensitive or offensive, but, like, it was just the way we joke with each other. I I specifically thought about that, because I remember one of the first times that you said that, I think I was like, dude, is that, like, is that cool? Like, Like, you know what I mean? And you were like, oh, no, 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 we don't need to cut that. Like, he's totally cool with it. And, you know, we say it on the podcast, and I'm sure the people that haven't heard us say it ad nauseum are probably like, Wow, what a couple of assholes! Yeah, making fun you of you know, and it's like, definitely yeah. not. Yeah, I fucking love Adam. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I have no ill will towards him, but you know what? I could refer to him as Adam, whose legs don't work too, and it yeah. doesn't somehow change the way I feel about him. So, well, so I mean, we used to, like when we worked together, he would holler, "Hey, fat guy," and I would reply, "Hey, cripple." So, there you go. <sighs> Been there. But anyway, yeah, so it's all contextual, and and I think that in the current climate, people are less inclined to consider context over um, just disqualifying things as being just off limits. Yeah. Do you have any more quotes you want to do before we wrap this up? I want to try something. I don't know if it's going to work, but what did I say earlier? I said you could flip to any random page and look at any random paragraph, and something's going to be entertaining. Yes. And here we go. This is just something I randomly flipped to. This is a, a, I'll give a little bit of context. Um, so this is um, this is just a little bit of setup very early in this in the book um, about his visits to the dentist. And I'm going to read a little more than I originally planned to, but this just helps with the context. I'd started bringing a bag whenever I went in for an appointment: magazines, music, pornography, a sketchbook, a journal, some snacks. It was like the bag my mother used to bring to church for me when I was little full of toys and distractions so I wouldn't start crying and interrupt Mass and piss off the priest. Because if I did, he'd tell God to make us die in a car crash on the way home. Can't we just wear our seatbelts? Seatbelts are no match for God, said my mother. <laughs> Jesus. That's yep. just... Oh, everything. <sighs> I, I, think, I think it's time, right? I don't know that there's... I mean, at this point, we're just kind of reading to entertain ourselves. Yeah, we're just... Yeah. Re- yeah. It's time. All right, Rob, I'll let you uh, I'll let you do the honors. All right. So if anybody for anybody who didn't listen to the previous episode um, where we we reviewed Glimpse, we actually when we were talking about the fact that we were going to be talking about this, we already gave our ratings. So it's a five star book. 
when we considered doing this book, uh, I hadn't read it in, in many years. And that, and while I remember it fondly, I didn't remember exactly why. And it's just because, you know, the distance of time from when I read it and everything. But when Livius would say it's the funniest book he'd ever read, I was always like, yeah, I remember it being funny, but that sounds like a strong thing to claim. And I, I was probably 30 to 40% through this book when I realized like what, really what that means everything in this book is entertaining line by line this is probably some of the most like unique and funny stuff you'll find in any book and and i know that sounds very strong but this book is rock solid entertainment the whole time it's funny it's endearing it's a little bit crass a lot crass um and and you just want to you just want to see what happens because it's so entertaining and so funny and it still manages to have a very workable plot that probably is as good or better than a lot of the other books that we've given high ratings to as well so i really don't see a downside for this book um it's just fucking entertaining and that's it five stars this is my fourth at least my third but i think it's my fourth time reading this book and i am no less entertained um on this reading than i was the very first time when i read it um i've read i mean i've read a few books that are really funny i know that we don't do it very often on the podcast i mean funny is not something that we typically you know um, you know get pulled into as far as books go Rob likes a lot of movies that are funny. I don't find most movies funny. Um, you know, I don't watch a ton of sitcoms. But this book, something about it comes back. I doubt I'll ever read a funnier book. Um, I'm also fairly certain because of its high entertainment value. I keep telling myself one day I'm going to do like like my 10 favorite books. And, and I know if I ever get around to that, that this will be in that 10 and probably in the top half of it. Um, I, you know in the event that Paul Nealon hears this, like you don't know the world, anything, buddy. All I'm going to say is that I am greatly saddened that there aren't more Paul Nealon books to read. So um, people could take that for what it's worth. I don't typically say, Hey, everybody should read this book, but I genuinely think that everybody should get a copy of this book and read it. You may fall into that very small percent, 5% of people that really don't like this book. It's based on Amazon reviews. Those people are stupid and they are wrong. Um, this is one of my all time favorite books and however many stars I get, I only give it five, but it's worth significantly more than that. Yeah, I, I, I will agree with you that this is definitely a book that everybody should buy and read hundred percent. And, and if all 14 of you do that, it'll shoot up the Amazon <laughs> rankings and Paul Nealon may sit down at his word processor and put out another book. Yeah, it could happen. I so even though he uh, wasn't interested in an interview when we uh, corresponded with him, I, I went back and I read last night the email uh, conversation between the two of us, and this was back in 2013. So this was early on in the podcast, and and quite a distance from when we're recording this episode. Um, but he was like super nice, and uh, it, it was obvious that he had at least checked out the podcast when uh, he responded to us. Uh, kind of explaining why he wasn't up for, for, you know, an interview at the time. And so like we got that feather in our cap. If he never publishes anything else, um, uh, it doesn't, you know, find a time that he wants to join us on the podcast. It was out there that like we were, you know, open to c collaborate and he was open as well. It just wasn't good timing. So um, we, you know, that's one where, we can at least say like, yeah, we were in talks with him because I, I, you know, he's a significant writer in our, in the, in the history of the podcast. Yeah. It, um, cause I thought about that email too. And I thought to myself that, um, getting a nice rejection email from him was definitely a lot more exciting <laughs> than, and I hate to say it this way. Cause I don't, you know what I mean? But like, mm -hmm. we've gotten yeses that I wasn't as excited about yeah. <laughs> than to get a nice rejection from him it was the same thing with with dallas with jack ketchum yep you know so obviously i still have hopes that at one point we'll have paul nealon on the podcast right um the the thing with with uh with dallas is uh is obviously a done deal and that's not going to happen but 
Um, sometimes it's it's just nice to be able to have some kind of communication with, and I'll say, you know, with one of your heroes. Like this is somebody whose work I appreciate the, to that level. So that's it. That's all I've got. I'm done talking about this book. Well, can I bring up something that um, uh, this has been a theme lately? There's a lot more. Um, uh, we were talking a lot more about the the people that are supporting us on Patreon and stuff like that, and I just want to quickly thank uh the postman we uh, we mentioned recently we had we had some new uh patreon supporters and he was one of them and we i we get a message uh earlier today on facebook saying hey guys um i don't remember exactly what he said but the gist of it was uh you know i I support you on patreon i was looking for your spoiler talk for alice isn't dead because he had read the book and he was interested in hearing what we had to say beyond the review and he couldn't find it, and he just wanted to know, you know, if there was something he was missing. And he was super polite about it. And Livius, so you know what my first thought was, right? Um, oh yes, yes, I do. Um, maybe that you didn't post it. <laughs> so, um, I'm not perfect, and from time to time, <laughs> I screw something up. And uh, like immediately, I read this, and I was like. Oh, fuck i know I, I know i forgot to post it and and this reminds me of um when we did that review for the twin peaks final dossier with um, mm-hmm. jesse lawrence yep. we recorded that and i don't know what the timing was of it or something but um it was like three weeks before i realized that we recorded it and i edited it and it never got <laughs> posted like everything was done all i had to do is type some stuff into a website and it would have been an episode and I was like, oh, my God, we never. So I had to post it like a month after. And it totally threw off because like in that episode, we were talking about stuff that was coming up and now it was all wrong. Um, so, yeah, I had completely forgotten to post the spoiler talk for Alice Isn't Dead uh, until the postman brought it to our attention. So thanks, buddy. We put it up uh, immediately when I got home and it's up for you. So thanks for pointing that out. Sorry to keep people waiting since November for the spoiler talk for Alice isn't dead, (laughs) but it's there now. You can hear our thoughts beyond the the review. I, um, yeah, so absolutely. (laughs) Thank you. And you know what? Call us out, man. Like if we miss something, if we misstate something, like you are absolutely welcome to message us or figure out a way to get hold of us, email, whatever it is that you want to do. You can call if, if you know where to get it, there's a booked phone number. I do know at least one person that uses it semi regularly. Yeah. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out. It's uh, it's good to know, and and we there. Are, okay, this podcast has zero checks and balances. Uh, here's a peek behind the curtain. Here's what happens. Uh, we're going to wrap this up in about ten or fifteen minutes. Rob and I are going to talk about other stuff. We're going to figure out what the next book we're reviewing. Oh, which we're actually going to do on the podcast. At any rate, you get the idea. And then Rob goes off and edits it and posts it, and we never fucking look at it again. <laughs> <laughs> that's so true so if we miss something or there's a, a glaring error like where we left in audio like i say something and then uh, i say to rob yeah you're gonna have to take that shit out yeah like fucking hit us up and let us know and we'll we'll do what we can to get a fix so we appreciate you guys being the uh the proof readers or proof listeners for this podcast so thank you the postman not just for being a contributor but for uh for getting that rectified for us yeah and for reading Alice isn't dead because that book needs you know all the support it you know deserves support is what I meant to say for sure although not as much as apathy and other small victories so the postman if you're listening pick pick up a copy of this one actually I will say I was talking uh, um, to someone at work today and and they were like hey what book should I read and then they immediately said that they read fantasy and sci-fi and I was like well I'm not going to be any help there Um, (laughs) your answer should have been absolutely anything else just anything else <laughs> but then i explained i was like well here's the book i i, I read most recently and i was te- i was telling him about it and then i i shared some quotes with him that we didn't share because they were just a little bit too graphic or spoilery um and he bought on i on on the ibook store he bought apathy on the spot so he could read it <sighs> apathy I don't even remember I came across it. I'm I'm pretty sure I was just walking through a bookstore or the library or something, and the cover caught my eye. Saw the cover. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you can judge a book just that way. You could put that. That could be a poster. It's such a good cover. It it could go in Inspiration Alley. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. 
Um, we also want to thank Julie, who's our newest Patreon contributor. So, Julie, thank you so much. Um, again, make sure you're paying attention and calling us out on our shit, which is really important. Now, I want to get to one more thing. Thomas Joyce, a couple of weeks ago, we had said <laughs> that he should listen to every episode of the podcast. And we had a breakdown of exactly how many hours, if he slept like six hours a night, we did all that. And he has taken on the challenge, sort of. He's not doing it in a row or anything. Um, but he's listening to one episode a day, <laughs> yes, which is. is super, super cool. But today, I, I had some realizations, so much so that I saw he posted what he was listening to today, and I went to like it, and then I changed my mind, and I didn't like it. Then I started typing him out a comment, and I, I was like, I'm not even doing that. I will just address it on the podcast. A couple of good things came to mind. Holy shit, I couldn't fucking listen to every episode of the book podcast. I've already listened to him once doing him live, which is more than I probably should have done. Second thing that came to mind is this poor bastard. It's going to take him another year to get caught up, right? Uh, Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at some point he'll catch up to the episodes he listened to. He probably won't listen to those again. So we'll say that it's going to be solidly 2020 by the time he's done. What's going to fucking happen when he runs out of episodes? We're in his ears every single night, and I am afraid that there's going to be some kind of fucking withdrawal or this guy's going to get our phone number and fucking call <laughs> us all the time because he just can't stand like going into the evening without listening to us. So I don't know if this is the healthiest thing that he could be doing. And I equate it to this. I think I told you. Um, I stumbled across. Okay, well, I'll give you the long story. There has been a TV show that's been running, um, I think, originally in Australia, but I know it's in the UK for like 40 years. It's called Countdown, which is a not very good game show that is um, essentially, uh, um, oh, God damn it, what are they called? Where they give you the letters and you got to make up words out of the letters that are there. Like oh, a like word scramble. And, if you... uh, uh, yeah, like that. Anagrams? Is it anagrams? I don't know if it's exactly an anagram. At any rate, the, the contestants randomly choose nine letters. You know, like they don't they, they just pick how many vowels and how many consonants they want. And then the 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 player with um, the longest word gets points. So you can make up to a nine letter word. So that's half the game. The other half of the game is that they pick random numbers and then a larger three digit number is generated. And they have to use just the um, seven numbers. I think it is mathematically to arrive at 361 or whatever that randomly generated number is. So it's a huge dork type show, right? But for a while I was watching this on YouTube a couple of years ago. So YouTube algorithms after I ran out of flat earth stuff to watch nine 11 conspiracy theory stuff to watch, um, uh, uh, 80s hair band music videos to watch recommended something called eight out of 10 cats does countdown which is the countdown TV show, which is still running today, but it is hosted by Jimmy Carr, who is a comedian and comedians play on teams and they play the same game. And I was completely fascinated by this. So for a period of a couple of months, I watched every single episode. I don't remember like 70 or 80 episodes that I watched and I would watch one or two every night. And now that I have no more new ones to watch, I feel like what Thomas Joyce is going to feel like in a year. <laughs> and it's not a happy place to be. So all I'm saying is it's the coolest thing ever that you're doing this. But I really want you to think about your health and your family, too. I, well, what Something. I'm hearing is that within the next year, we're going to have to find some way to go do a daily podcast. Um, that is, that's the other thing that can happen. I, we're going to need more Patreon dollars oh, for that. And I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm not shilling for Patreon money. All I'm saying is that the current Patreon level is not enough for uh, us to give up our jobs <laughs> and do this full time. Cause I would totally rather do this than what I'm doing yeah, that's currently. True. I didn't mention it at the top of the episode. I'm going to mention it now without saying anything, but I was reminded recently that Paul Nealon and I worked for the same company, not at the same time not in the same location, but that's another kinship I have with him. <laughs> um, very nice. I want to, I want to yeah. break in with a little update on the postman. While we were talking about this four minutes ago, he posted onto Patreon. Um, ah, yeah. Just got home from work and caught this update. You folks rock. Can't wait to listen. So, 
Um, he he saw the update. He saw that we got the spoiler talk on there, and he is going to put it in his ears. So good for him. Which is what all Patreon subscribers can do for as little as one dollar a month. <sighs> yeah, yeah. So, what else you got, buddy? We have to, to make a decision on the next book now. I thought I had the next book picked out. Sounds promising. And I sent Rob. I sent Rob a picture of it. And I don't even think Rob entertained the idea that I was serious about this. Oh my God, no, that's not happening. <laughs> so this this I, might be the first time in booked history that I put my foot down. <clears throat> Here's what I'm going to say. I'm going to give you the two options that I came up with for this week. And hopefully, hopefully we can pick from one of them. <laughs> but I strongly encourage the listeners, if for some reason you hear one of the books and you think that's the one we should review, obviously it'll be way too late for us to do it next week. But I think that you should all contact Rob directly via Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, the email, the phone number, whatever, and let him know that maybe we made the wrong decision. That's fair, right? Sure. Yeah, okay. I'll take it. I'll take it. So book number one, which is the one that I communicated to Rob, because I didn't know this was a thing. This came out apparently, um, I guess, last Tuesday, was a new book by E.L. James. Now, if that <sighs> name sounds familiar to you, it is because she was the author of Fifty Shades of Grey. This new book is called The Mister, and I'm going to go ahead and read the synopsis. London 2019. Life has been easy for Maxim Trevelyan. I'm With his fucking, good looks. No. <laughs> aristocratic no. connections. In All right. So you're saying no to that one, Rob? Is that that's the one that you would do? I mean, you don't want to do it's right. It's not happening. You can continue to read this if you want to. All right. All right. All right. Listeners, if you really want to hear that, <laughs> I strongly encourage you to hit Rob up personally multiple times a day. Um, the other one that I came across, which actually just came out today. Um, is by Christopher Golden. Do you know yes. that name, Rob? Yes. All right. So Christopher Golden um, uh, is on the Three uh, Three Guys with Beards podcast alongside Jonathan Mayberry and another guy whose name um, escapes me. Um, we reviewed Snowblind Yeah. Um, quite a while ago. Um, another book uh, that I loved from years and years and years ago um, by him, which we didn't review, but I've always kind of kept the the door open to reading more um, from him of Saints and Shadows, which was a vampire series that he wrote probably back in the early 2000s, maybe even in the late night. Oh, hold on. I think I've got it here. I think it's from the early 2000s. Um, well, this version is from 2016. So at any rate, um, he, he has a new book out today. So that was going to be the other one that I was going to bring up. It's called The Pandora Room. It has um, stuff to do with, like, Pandora's box, but like a modern version of that. Archaeologist and a science expert kind of discover something that apparently could be. I didn't read the whole thing, but that was the uh, that was the other one I was thinking. So would either one of those be something you'd be interested in reviewing for the next episode? I Yeah. Uh, yeah. What Which the, one? What was the <laughs> max? What was it? Maxim? I do. I, I still have it open. I do. Trevelyan. Maxim Trevelyan. T R E V E L Y A N. Trevelyan. Oh God. I, I don't. <laughs> that's never fucking. I will end the podcast before I read that book. Oh, my God, guys. I don't. Uh, oh. Or here's the other thing. This is how you can get that book on the podcast. You remember how? Oh, wait, so, so you're gonna end the pot, or there's another way. Okay, I'm listening. Let's see what the. <laughs> you remember we how we had that episode where uh, me and Ryan, the marketing intern, were just driving around talking about stuff. <laughs> Is it gonna be me driving around talking about this book? No. If you find someone that's not me to record, to read and record a review of that book without me, and I do the intros and outros with you, that's the only way this this book is ever going to be on the podcast all right listeners you have your challenge set for you you just heard uh, the parameters that rob said um <laughs> if somebody wants to read and review this but rob's thing is he gets a week off if he if somebody takes him I mean, up that's on this the selfish part of it yeah so if you are interested um hit us up let us know i, I mean 
I don't know. I don't know if it's fair to do like a first come first serve. Maybe we'll have to have some kind of voting. Pro- I, I don't know how to best do this. But if you're interested, hit us up. Um, you've essentially got till um, probably a week from today. So we'll say the 30th, the 29th or the 30th. Um, if you're interested in doing that and from the people that want to do that, we will uh, be com- give us compelling reasons, I guess, because I expect I fully expect we'll have more than one person offer to do this. Um, and then from those, we'll we'll pick one and we'll figure something out. So I think in two weeks, I'm going to be reviewing the mister. <laughs> <laughs> you do that. You just go ahead and do that. I would be Next. tickled if that actually <laughs> happened. Next week, um, Christopher Golden, the Pandora Room. Yes? Yes. All right. Love it. Uh, that's it. That's it for this 250th book review. Until book 251. I'm Livia Snedden. And I'm Rob Olson. Keep reading. No, oh, yeah, dude. Find someone to read it with you. you can make that that we'll make it happen. Oh my god, dude, hold on. There's a two star review. This is so disappointed. And that says at least with fifty shades, the characters were relatable and had dimension. <laughs> oh no. Holy! Oh my God! This person—I was gonna say, holy shit! I look at the screen. And this person, in the review actually says, "Holy schmoly!" <laughs> oh! <clears throat> I get Lynn Shulman to review this with me. She can tell me about how Fifty Shades had those uh, those relatable and uh, and characters with dimension. Oh, holy shit! What I get myself into? Holy schmoly! Holy schmoly! <laughs>